So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our uh, November mini school on phylogenetic inference and, and machine learning. Machine learning, not machine learnings. <laughs> machine learning. Uh, our two lecturers for this mini school are Professor Martin Bucha, that you see on top of your Zoom window, window and Dr. Yapi Grief, who might, ah, who's just joined. <laughs> So let me start by introducing uh, Martin. Uh, Martin is a, is a director of research at the French Nation, National Center for Scientific Research, uh, also known as CNRS in Paris. And he's based at Paris, uh, at the Paris Cité University. <clears throat> uh, he's, a he's an honorary and fractionally, fractional <laughs> professor at, uh, at UKZ10 and the University of Stellenbosch. He's also uh, an associate of, of NITEX, a member of the Academy of Sciences uh, of South Africa. And his um, main day job is that he's a, a theoretical particle physics and, uh, and cosmologist. <clears throat> yeah. And in, uh, a few years ago, he shared the Gruber Prize in cosmology with, um, with the Planck uh, Consortium. Yeah. And more recently, uh, Martin, together with Professor Moll of UCT, uh, wrote uh, a book that was published by the Academy of Sciences on, uh, on COVID-19 to mainly address at, uh, at high school learners uh, and teachers so that they could uh, understand the scientific background of the pandemic. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Yapi Grief, who just joined, but is hiding <laughs> with, uh, with a switched off camera. Yeah, he's the deputy director of the School of Computer. Hello, Yapi, now we can see you. Welcome. Uh, he's the deputy director of the School of Computer Science and Information System at Northwest University. And, uh, um, and he's also a, a, a NITEX associate. He's an electronic engineer by, by training. Uh, and has a big interest in um, educating engineers. And his main uh, scientific interests are in artificial intelligence, uh, in game, in serious game development. I don't know what unserious game development is, but maybe you can tell us later. Yeah? And in the creation of technology artifacts that impact people at, at a human level. Yeah? And Martin and, and Yapi agreed to share this uh, uh, this mini school and today we start I guess with Martin uh, who will speak about the reconstruction of family trees from genomic data. So Martin and Yapi, uh, over to you. And sorry, um, I always forget, please use the, the Q&A facility at the bottom of the Zoom screen to ask questions and maybe at the end of the lecture we can offer people the opportunity to ask questions in person yeah so thank you very much martin and yapi i'm really looking forward to to your presentation this month okay well um thank you for giving us the opportunity to um uh, give this many school and uh, i want to i would like to give you briefly an overview of the, you know, what, what is ahead. Um, and, and also um, give, talk a bit about the uh, um, uh, sort of point of view and, you know, at least some of my limitations with respect to the subject. So um, the, First two lectures will be given by myself, and um, I've tried to keep things simple. But uh, basically, today um, there's you know all this technology. So, um, for example, with um, COVID nineteen, there are, you know literally millions of viral genomes that have been um, sequenced. So this would get qualify as is is big data, um, and um, new methods are needed in order to to you know analyze and put make sense of this data. So um, I'm going to talk today um, 
uh, a bit about the you know biological background and it's things are going to be be simplified so those of you who know a lot about genetics are going to say well but you know um uh, you you didn't mention that, but I sort of want to give the foundations in a rather simple way, and I'm going to give a hint as to you know what are uh, the techniques of making uh, some of the techniques of making trees, and then lecture two is going to be more of a you know computer science algorithm lecture where you know based on the ideas today and there are a lot of um simplifications you know how what do you do when you you have um very large data sets and then for lectures three and four we're going to um slightly um uh, shift uh, gear to um uh, looking at uh, how AI can be uh, applied to different uh, problems in, in, in medicine. And um, uh, Yapi is an engineer and a computer scientist who has worked in industry and made real things <laughs> as opposed to, you know, um, I guess there's also the more mathematical uh, computer science, and he's going to share with you, you know, how some of the um, AI techniques can can be used, and and uh, so it'll be be somewhat hands on. So I think that will be um, exciting. So ju just with the bios, let me say I. Uh, uh, you know, my knowledge of, uh, I come from theoretical physics and uh, to some extent astrophysical data analysis, um, but, it, uh, and I'm not a, a specialist at, at genetics by any means, but I, I think you'll see that some of the, the problems can be abstracted uh, quite a bit. And, you know, there's more and more of a, a place for theoretical physics and and, and computer science and in in medicine. Okay, um, so uh, I just want to uh, um, start very quickly, you know, rather early, and um, so you know, molecular biology is you know maybe. 70 years old or, or, or something like that. And, you know, the big breakthrough was uh, uh, discovering DNA and more recently sequencing it. But there's always been this uh, sort of desire um, to, to sort of classify uh, life and, you know, make trees through, through fossils. And, you know, this this goes back very uh, far. So to sort of simplify things, um, you know, one of the um, key figures was uh, Carl Linnaeus, who um, basically made an attempt to classify all types of life. So, you know, the, uh, based on various uh, characteristics, and this is still, you know, a field that exists today and people argue about what is the best way to do it. Um, but uh, molecular biology, uh, I mean, really uh, gives you a lot more tools and a lot more things to look at so that today you can um, uh, sort of trace back the past to some extent without having any fossils. So um, this is, uh, you know, from the 1700s. So English was not the language of science. It was uh, Latin at that time. And you, you, you see these, you know, different uh, classifications of, uh, you know, animals and fish, insects, and, you know, a lot of that um, 
survives and is, you know, confirmed. And, you know, in the modern uh, classification you, 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 you have, so this would be a little like a um, computer science tree, you know, that you, you break things up into domains. So that, that would be the, you know, first level and kingdoms, uh, phyla, classes, orders, families, and, you, uh, you know, and you can sort of imagine that uh, without a, a lot of information, this is a little like, you know, a library classification system or something like that. And people have argued about it. And so you have these, you know, prokaryota, eukaryota. So the, these are, um, it, you know, the, the structure of the cell, does it have a separate nucleus? And then, you know, these different subdivisions, and then it, it goes on, on like that. So this is sort of an old story. And then we want to look at, well, what does uh, DNA um, bring to this? And basically, there are just so many uh, more characteristics that you can look at that um, it, 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 it's uh, um, a lot more powerful and there are also markers that you, that 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 uh, don't uh, um, translate into phenotypes so um you, you you can trace the evolutionary uh, history much better so this is really a, a breakthrough so let's um I mean, DNA is, you know, really the basis of our life and, you know, how life replicates. And um, we can't talk about everything. So, you know, here we sort of want to focus on how we can use um, molecular information to establish relationships between species or people, individuals within the same species in, in time. So um, this is, uh, you know, here we um, see the, the double uh, helix and, um, and you know, you you have this uh, code with uh, four letters A, C, G, and T, which are you know these. Um, this is sort of a, a zoom, and, um, and 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 these are different molecules. So you 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 have a a, a polymer or directed. Um, polymer and there's a, a sense to it. So the the five prime end and three prime end, this is jargon, but you should just think of, well, there's an order. And if you read something backwards, it's it's not the same. But um we can to some extent uh uh reduce all of the information into just uh, character strings with an alphabet consisting of, uh, of four, four letters. And um, here you see, um, well, there's G uh, pairs with C and A with T. And um, so this, you know, provides a way of replicating and um, the, the whole story is a, a little more uh, complicated than this um, because there is epigenetics and what gets copied and um, there's a lot that people don't understand. But now with uh, um, modern sequencing, um, it's, it's possible basically to to take some DNA or RNA that's converted into DNA 
and and basically just read out this um, this string. And we're going to be talking about how to exploit this um, information uh, for our, our purposes. So we're not going to um, really focus on uh, proteins and 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 which are are, are um, the uh, coded by this and. You know, there's a whole story to that and what gets made and, and what sell. But we're just going to, for our purposes, just use this as a, a marker. So the replication is rather accurate, um, but there are mistakes that happen um, called mutations. And um, these put in in markers, and you know, uh, we'll see that uh, you know some mutations could just just uh, uh, kill the uh, offspring, but others um, are just uh, completely neutral, so they just serve as as as, as markers. So. Um, that's the aspect that we're we're mainly going to use here. You know, we're not really that interested for the purpose of this lecture and the following lecture on on natural um, selection. Okay, so I've sort of explained to you why um, uh, uh, um, every the DNA can be uh, just considered as a, a character string with uh, you know four four letters, and I think it's also good to you know get some orders of of magnitude. Um, so uh, this is the this isn't kilo bits. Um, it's you know kilo base. Uh, base pairs, basically, so that this is, you know, what is the, the length of the word? Um, so a, a base, since there are four, would be, be two bits. And um, the smallest uh, virus has uh, a size of, uh, you know, 1.8 uh, kilo base. Um, which is is you know very very small in, indeed, and of course a, a virus is not uh, viable by itself. It needs a, a host organism. HIV is about well uh, ten kilobase, so it would be twenty kilobytes. The coronavirus is about three times as large. And then um, I, I didn't want to make this table too long. Uh, e. coli is just a typical bacterium. Um, yeast is, uh, you know, multicellular. Um, so um, then the fruit fly, you know, we we go up to, by a factor of ten. You know, where you have. Um, quite a bit of differentiation. A bird um, is maybe about an order of magnitude more complex. And the human is not that much more complex than the bird. And oddly enough, wheat is, has a um, much larger genome than, than humans. So, you know, we're not uh, at the pinnacle of of creation by all, all measures. So that's sort of an interesting uh, fact. And then I just wanted to give um, people a, a sort of order of magnitude of how much do um, people vary from other people. And um, they're, you know, quite in, in terms of the genetic code. So uh, we we don't, you know, we haven't sequenced uh, 
very large number of, of humans completely. This is sort of a um, new area to you know, understand the variations, what's responsible for diseases and that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, here we're looking at uh, precision medicine, but approximately one in a thousand sites on the, the genome, you'll, you, you, you will find um, variations between people or variations that have been, you know, discovered. So, these are sort of um, potential markers that, that can be used. Okay, um, so I wanted to, so of course the human genome, we, we can't, it, it wouldn't really make sense to, to show it because, you know, I, I, uh, you know, six gigabyte dump, um, really wouldn't be something that you can look at with a bare eye. But um, I, just as an example, and this is the kind of data that's um, available. So this is with the um, coronavirus. And uh, you can find on the web, this is the, you know, original or supposedly original Wuhan strain that got sequenced very early. And you can just go to um, uh, the web and you, you can download all sorts of genomic data. So I was just going to show you a bit of what it looks like. So it's not as if uh, people wanting to do research in this area would have to do uh, collect the data and the data would be proprietary. And, you know, there's certainly some of that, but there's a vast amount of data that's publicly available. And it's also quite, um, yeah, significant that I, I think this, uh, um, is, uh, you know, policy to make uh, uh, as much uh, encourage or force researchers to make as much data available as possible. So um, there's a lot that can be searched. And here I show you, so, you know, if, if you get these slides, you can um, look at it yourself. So this is the um coronavirus uh at the beginning and 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 you you got 30,000 uh um a acgts and um and and you can find this and um it mutates you know uh about once every 3 weeks another um change gets put on. Um, so that, uh, uh, I mean, one has a sort of divergent evolution. So here we have a, a situation where there is, was possibly just one, you know, genome that jumped to the, the humans and then, you know, the, the rest is history, many copies, but you 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 can think of that there's this um, family tree that goes back to this. The reality could be slightly more complicated. Um, okay, let's go to the um, code, and I'm just going to show some of the data that's uh, available, and um, I'll put some interpretation in, but basically where um, uh, the DNA is, is coding, meaning that uh, it gets uh, translated, uh, transcribed onto the RNA, and then, you, you know, it's, uh, um, it, it's, uh, 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 translated into proteins. So there are um, 22 amino acids and you need some 
start and stop signals and there's some redundancy. So here we see these sequences of, uh, of three bases and, um, and here it tells you what the amino acid is that is made. So there are a number of things to notice here. Well, uh, there's a certain amount of redundancy. So there, there are some changes in the genome that will uh, change uh, the amino acid, but there are also a lot that that uh, don't really make any any difference. The other thing you notice is that it's not really um, that obvious how to to read things because you know on each strand there you 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 have to know there are three possible reading frames. So. Um, you, you know, this this is, you know, one, two, three, one, two, three, and then you can shift it in, in three possible ways. So um, uh, it, it, it's it's not all that that clear um, what the proteins will be. And it's also where where things start. There's some other uh, conditions sort of um, upstream. That must be be satisfied. So the this suddenly sort of gives you a guide. Um, okay, so um, these amino acids. It's also useful when people figure out so with a particular genome what proteins are made. To so um, a protein is basically a, a polymer with these uh, you know. 22 amino acids and, and you know varying length and varying order. Um, and then you can find in this uh, database, well, what is the um, protein formed? So that this is sort of more uh, restrictive and this gives you a lot of information. Do, does the um, changing a certain base uh, change the protein or, or not. And you can learn a lot of um, information from that. Um, you can also, so a small fraction um, in more complex organisms uh, of the DNA actually codes something. Um, so most of it is, uh, is is uh, I guess the human genome is supposed to have twenty thousand um, genes or or something like that, and there's a lot of you know non coding part that may or may not be relevant. And there, you would expect changes to not make any difference if there were certain. Um, amino acids in the protein that were really essential to its function, then um, a change there would, uh, you know, kill the organism and and and, and be the the end. Um, so I'm I'm just sort of um, mentioning this so you can sort of, uh, um, without looking at the details, see the importance of you know the that of different parts of the genetic code and we're going to really simplify things with uh, uh, trying to um, trace our ancestry. I'll just mention um, that there there's also these um, repeating sequences that um, are quite, interesting and some of them don't do anything at all. Some, if you have too many copies, it'll cause some sort of disease or, or something. But when you have um, these repeats, this is there, the, there can be sort of slippage in both uh, directions. So you, 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 you get a lot of uh, polymorphism. And this is how you know DNA 
is used to identify people, for example, and um, uh, in, in, in crime scenes and that kind of thing, because you want to look at a few number of places where there is a, a lot of uh, variation. Okay, let's um, move on a bit to um, the applications. So um, phylogeny is basically uh, a family tree, and this is from um, uh, a nature paper not so long ago where um, it, it sort of shows what um, the relationship is between all these um, species today. And um, there's some sort of um, things that are, are quite different in this plot from uh, a sort of classification before the um, uh, you know molecular biology approach to establishing phylogenies and that we have a, a scale here. So this is very roughly uh, how many substitutions there are per site. So we'll talk about this um, a little later, but um, basically the, you know, length between from here to here corresponds to a sort of genetic distance. And then, you know, there's the same thing here. And if you have a, a common origin, if everything would line up, then all of these animals would um, be, uh, you know, on the same same vertical um, line, and you know that kind of happens, but not not completely. So here you see that there's there there seems to be be more distance, and here a bit less. So. Um, this doesn't completely work. Um, so we'll we'll talk a little about this more um, quantitatively. So this is uh, you know what is phylogeny? Well, you can establish these relationships without looking at fossils, and then you can, of course, use fossils to try to um, confirm what what you. Um, the, the tree that you established using molecular methods. Okay, <clears throat> this is uh, uh, a bit of an artist. Uh, I'll show you a, a picture of the you know coronavirus story. Um, so this looks a little like a, a sort of Halloween uh, poster, but here you have the tree and these different uh, branches coming off. And, and, and uh, this is of course very simplified and, and schematic. And um, this was obviously um, made at the uh, beginning of the Omicron because the Omicron is, uh, you know, sort of took over the, the tree. Um, Okay, so this is a bit of an artist's conception. And here we have something more um, uh, data-based, uh, not uh, um, schematic. And I'm not sure there are many more genomes available, but I just, uh, um, this is between January, 2021 and you know for over one year and um and 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 so what you see is the uh, the omicron is here and this is a, a new branch and then here you have the you know various delta and um the problem is that you 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 can't really draw a tree um, is is uh, you know in the the first slide with 
you know, where you had maybe 20 species. So there's a lot of visualization tools and you can go to next strain and there's the um, data from this GISAID um, database, which um, has not all, but uh, many of the um, uh, COVID that has been sequenced with some meta information. So um, we, we could, if you were on the site on the web and you can do this yourself, you can sort of zoom in and there, there are tools to sort of look at these, um, these trees. But when you have a tree of, you know, with a, a million um, members on the, the tree, you, um, you, you can't really look at it all at once and visualization becomes a, a big problem. Okay, let's um, turn a little to um, theory, and it's uh, a bit, uh, I mean, some of the methods and assumptions that we're going to be talking about uh, really got poo-pooed when, uh, when they were first put forward. And um, this is because when DNA was first discovered, um, people saw this as, you know, well, this is the, the sort of mechanism behind uh, Darwin's theory. So it was sort of thought that every mutation was important and people wanted to see natural selection in, in everything. And um, as uh, it, the first uh, protein sequencing became available, uh, Linus Pauling and Zuckerkandl um, proposed that you could, uh, you know, look at the um, uh, distance and define a sort of distance and uh, um, uh, the number of, of mutations and that that was a genetic clock. And that was very, uh, contested because people thought, well, everything has to do with fitness and, you know, change comes in spurts. There's the Cambrian explosion when all sorts of species, new species emerged very quickly. So that sort of goes against this uh, steadily ticking clock. And then as more data became available, um, the uh, Japanese-American uh, geneticist Kimura proposed uh, the neutral, I think he called it the neutral theory of molecular evolution. So this is a hypothesis that is, of course, in the absolute uh, sense going to be wrong because obviously there are some changes that are, are significant. But basically what he, um, so I'll sort of go the, through this uh, as I had written it. So you have uh, sequencing of proteins first by uh, Sanger and um, then uh, a uh, DNA sequencing was uh, more difficult, but uh, you, uh, you, you um, developed where, you know, first only short segments could be um, sequenced. And the mutation rate was much higher than expected. So Kimura argued that if all these mutations would... Uh, have uh, uh, an impact on, on survival or the, the fitness of the organism, you would um, uh, acquire so many deleterious mutations that you know life couldn't continue. So he proposed, well, you know, some of the mutations are important, but most of them really don't matter hardly at all. So it's sort of like a, a random walk. 
And there is this uh, paradox where, you know, it's called Mueller's ratchet and you make a, um, a model where there's a finite population and um, then uh, mutations can that are deleterious can appear and because the population is finite, there's a sort of random walk and um, some of them will get fixed. <laughs> so the beneficial um, original uh, polymorphism um, um, no longer uh, exists and you just acquire more, sort of like a ratchet that goes one way. So how do you deal with that? So Kimura introduced uh, genetic drift and this is this idea that a lot of the changes that take place are just random and uh, if the selection isn't strong enough, uh, some of them will get fixed. In other words, you have this sort of diffusion or random walk where the fraction goes between zero and one, and these are absorbing boundary conditions. So some of them will, um, will just, just get um, fixed, as he says, and there's no need to explain um, uh, why this change had to happen because of the environment. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's see. I think I wanna go a little faster so I get done. Um, so most changes are just uh, um, single base changing and um, you know, depending on on where the base is, that might um, result in in uh, in the offspring not being viable, or it it it, it might just be a, a random walk. Okay, so let's come up with the simplest model of 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 these changes. So we're going to. Um, assume that, well, we have this alphabet of uh, four characters. Um, uh, wait, I'm sorry, this should be um, it, mutations at different sites are uncorrelated. So um, they're, they're, and we're not going to consider insertions and deletions, they're less frequent. So this is a, a simplified model that um, would work over short times. Um, we write an ODE and then um, where this is the mutation rate and then we can um, solve this so we have you know the original base and the three others, and we do some math, and we 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 get this uh, um, basically uh, decay where this is one, this decays to a quarter, and then this rises from zero to a quarter. Um, so this is um, simplistic. And um, then we can um, uh, calculate a transition probability or to, to see a change after a certain time t. And then we can, um, uh, you know, convert the observed probability. So, you know, we have this random process. It's a binomial process like flipping a weighted coin and we get a, a genetic time. So the decay rate is in here, but um, if you're not worried about the particular time, then this um, will give you something that is sort of um, additive. And I'm going to change this into a, a likelihood. If I look at N sites and I, observe, oops, that this should be M rather than D 
well, the data is the number of mutations, and you get this binomial distribution, and you can do maximum likelihood and Bayesian inference and all of that. So we're going to go, go back to this. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a bit about um, phylogenies and comparing trees, so comparing um, histories. And this is a, a great book by Joseph Felsenstein, who um, you know, worked on the subject way before it pop was popular. Um, some of the newer techniques are, are not in this book, but this is a good starting place. And I'm going to show you some of the figures from the, the book. So let's go back to, um, this is not actually the way it was done, but um, uh, uh, Pauling and Zucker candles hypothesis about the genetic clock. Well, these are, are different um, primates here and their um, distances associated with this. And we um, observe them just today. So if we would want to say, well, is this a molecular clock a good approximation, then we can, you know, the distance from the colobus to the human should be the same as the distance from the colobus to the orangutan and the um, chimp and the gorilla and all of that. So there's a, a testable um, prediction that you can um, that you can look at, and you know, since the genome is big, you can try it on different genes and different parts and compare. So this is a testable um, uh, 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 hypothesis. So in the original Zucker Kandal paper, there was, uh, well, no, I think this is Kimura who had better data. You know, they looked at uh, cow, dog, human, and then a lamprey. Uh, which is sort of going very far back. And the fact that the distance from this sort of ancient species to the uh, newer species was all the same shows that the molecular clock isn't all that bad. So this is, there is science here that's testable and this isn't just uh, pure theory. Okay, um, I want to, now turn a bit to uh, uh, counting trees, because this is uh, going to uh, be important when we talk about algorithms. So if we have, for example, um, uh, uh, four species, you know, here we have, I think it's uh, 16 trees. So we, we have enough computer power to try out 16 possibilities or um, something like that. So you, you can come up with these uh, probabilistic methods and, you know, find the perfect solution. But um, we're going to see that the number of trees is the number of species goes up, explodes faster than any exponential. So I'm going to show you how to count trees. <laughs> so if the rules are that a, a new species, you know, is a, a, a binary branch, then if we add uh, um, uh, another uh, species, then you see that there's um, uh, uh, um, the uh, they can be added in, in any one of these, these segments. And we can, um, so here there, there are three ways to, to add, um, uh, to make distinct trees if I add a, a C and then I do it again. And 
and there, there are five. So it's sort of one times three times five, et cetera. So um, we, we can look at how the number of trees grows and you can see, well, um, that, you know, with, with modern computers, you're, you're, you're going to be able to maybe go down to here, but, you know, we can't do 30 species uh, just doing a loop over every single possible tree. So you have to find some more efficient way. So it's a little like the traveling salesman problem that uh, it's, it's not something that you can, you know, find the perfect solution um, generally with um, uh, finite computing power. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, then the other point to make is that, uh, you know, if we just look at distances, we, we don't see the root of the tree. So it's sort of an unrooted tree. And here, um, this isn't the best diagram, but um, if these were species today, what I uh, what one would do is, uh, you, you know, you would find the point that has the largest distance to all the other points. And 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 so I guess that would be six here, and um, so there's the prediction that there would be you know one or two farthest away points from the other points, and all the distances would be the same, and then you you find a halfway point, and. And then, uh, I mean, we can't really tell what this distance is, but here we've rooted the tree based on the distance. But a lot of the recovery methods are going to give you a sort of unrooted tree, which is, uh, I guess, a tree in the um, computer science jargon is, uh, you know, um, acyclic, uh, well, here, here are the rooted tree, um, acyclic graph. So there are no, no, no cycles in here. And here it's directed um, that there's sort of a, a sense, you know, that this is the beginning, et cetera. <clears throat> okay, so let me, I'm running out of time, but I would like to give you a preview to what we'll talk about um, next time. And um, so we're, we're going to go into algorithms. So the first question is, well, how do you assess the reliability of the reconstructions? So there are a lot of assumptions here that are only approximations. So, you know, you, you, you sort of want to estimate uh, how good your, your tree is. And um, so we'll, we'll talk a, a little about that. Um, um, okay, um, the, then I'll just go over the different methods in a few words. So, um, parsimony is, I guess, you know, stinginess. So you want to make up, we're trying to make up a, a story and we um, uh, favor the tree that requires the less, least number of, of mutations. So that's, um, that's um, uh, the principle of parsimony. And there's some nice algorithms for, for doing this. Now the um, problem with this is that, uh, you know, the simplest story is not always the true story. And we saw that in the molecular clock, it's a, a stochastic thing. It's like, you know, counting time from radioactive decays. And if you only have a, 
certain number of counts, uh, not an infinite, uh, then you know your your clock isn't going to be accurate. So parsimony methods are almost only, uh, I mean, are are not completely reliable. Then um, you can simplify things with uh, distance methods, where there's just this distance matrix between all the you know, leaves of the tree, but that's n squared. So that's uh, doesn't scale very nicely. Neighbor joining methods can be made to uh, not have this n squared um, behavior. And then um, if we look at these uh, statistical uh, methods or you know I, I wrote down um a likelihood for a, a certain genetic distance you know then you can do maximum likelihood as you know you do in a lot of statistics or you can have uh bayesian methods that will say well this is the most probable tree but you know under the hypotheses it could uh be some other tree and then when you get millions of, you know, a million genomes or even much less, you know, you're you're not going to be able to um, realize any of these ideal methods by looping over all of the possibilities. So you you have to settle for a non-optimal solution that has a good chance of being right. So we'll We'll talk a bit, uh, I guess we'll just talk about algorithms in the, the next lecture, you know, based on the, the principles that um, I sort of presented in uh, the most simple way in this lecture. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, Martin, thank you so much for a very nice, sorry, very nice introduction. Um,